Just, we're so lucky that Baker Creek and everybody that works uh, from Pataluma here puts this on for us. It's an incredible event, so I'm really excited to be here. I flew in last night from Oregon. We have a wholesale nursery in Oregon. Um, I have a lot to tell you about today, so um, I wrote down my first comments, but we'll get through those and then it will be varieties. I just have so much to cover. I'll tell you when the slide list starts, because uh, we aren't going to be talking about those. We won't be showing those at the beginning. Okay. I wish the slides were a little bit brighter for you. The, the light in the back really uh, changes things. We at Log House Plants, and I wish this was lighter too. Can you turn it down a little bit? We can turn it across from the back. I can't hear you. Yeah, we can't hear it. Okay. How can we improve this, David? Because it's kind of too muted. Okay. Better, 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 better. Better? Is that better? Okay. We at log, we at log, it's really not good. This is, I talk too fast to have this work. Let's see if we can get it just a little bit better. We at, we at, testing, testing, testing. Maybe I'll do this one instead. Should I do this one instead? I just want it to work better. Is that good? Is that better? Yeah. No. Is it? I'm not going to do this one. Okay, is this one working? Okay, great. Much better. Okay, we at Log House Plants are thrilled to be growing beautiful plants for home gardeners and the independent retail nursery market in Oregon, Washington, and beyond. Let me fill you in on how this amazing situation came about. In our senior year of college, it was 1974, we bought our place in the woods east of Cottage Grove on Dorino Lake, a beautiful farm on Rack Creek with a back 40, a, a, a donkey, and a log house built in 1929. We started our first greenhouse, naming our wholesale nursery Log House Plants, and opened our retail bookstore on Main Street called The Bookbine in Cottage Grove. We are 24 years old. Rat Creek was and is a wonderful place to be. There weren't many nurseries when we started in Oregon, when we started our nursery, now Oregon grows the third highest output of nursery and greenhouse plant material in the United States, exporting 75% of our nursery crops, our biggest agricultural commodity to other states. We feel very lucky to have settled in the Willamette Valley, one of the world's five most fertile and perfectly suited valleys for seed growing the only one such in the United States. The other four similar sites start nearby in coastal areas of the southwest of British Columbia and then leap across the world from certain parts of Chile and Australia to the Mediterranean. Our extraordinarily productive Willamette Valley boasts the ideal climate for production of seed crops mild winters, warm, dry summers, highly fertile alluvial soils that can be half to, up to a half mile deep in a growing season of 140 days. For decades, farmers in the Willamette Valley have produced the world's grass seed on over 500,000 acres and the world's hazelnuts and more than 90% of the world's brassica seed. That would be broccoli, cauliflower, kale, radish, rutabaga, turnip, Swiss chard, European cabbage, just to name a few. Specialty seed crop growers of vegetables and flowers abound, especially since the 1980 Space Shuttle Program development bumped flower seed growing north from its former U.S. capital in Lompoc, California. 
The Willamette Valley has nurtured world-famous seed production throughout the past century, and many of our farms are multi-generational operations, profitable and supportive of a high-value industry. Since more vegetable seed is produced in the Willamette Valley than anywhere else in the world. Today, this priceless, pristine growing environment has entered the global debate about contamination of seed by other crops, notably canola. The required purity of broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, chard, and other brassica seed could be compromised if canola plants are grown west of the Cascades, both GMO and not. At stake is our premier vegetable seed industry, and the Department of Agriculture jury is still out. They are allowing small test plots currently, but that's another story. But with all of this as backstory, what I want to tell you about is this recent hotbed of artisan vegetable breeders and new creative seed companies that are located in the Willamette Valley and up and down the West Coast. These dedicated folks are seeking to improve and stabilize delicious open pollinated varieties through traditional breeding, then creating stock seed to multiply and market. Some are working with sponsors, like our Log House Plants Supernaturals Grafted Vegetable Partnership, which sponsors seven West Coast breeders and Jim Myers' indigo tomato work at Oregon State University. We work with Aaron Whaley to stabilize and multiply our breeder stock seed and distribute this innovative vegetable seed nationally and internationally. Each breeder is compensated with 10% of the gross sales of their distributed varieties. Supernaturals Grafted Vegetables LLC and Aaron Whaley currently are trialing over 80 experimental lines and 120 new varieties in Modesto, including all the indigos of the world. We will be hosting seed companies again this week on Friday and Saturday. We are working with breeders under the structure called participatory plant breeding. This model has been around for years and has been especially effective in third world countries. Participatory plant breeding involves a close collaboration between farmers and researchers, which much of the breeding work done in farmers' fields. This program model enables farmers, and this is where your slide list starts, this is double red sweet corn. It enables farmers to select and adopt crop varieties to their specific conditions of their own regions and gives farmers voice and partners lab science with local knowledge. This is Kiwa in Philomath, Oregon. The Organic Seed Alliance recently published an exceptional 55-page participatory plant breeding toolkit that can be easily downloaded from their website. On your slide list, I note the website. The Organic Seed Alliance has a goal of improving the success of organic plant breeding projects, leading to more and higher quality varieties bred specifically for organic agriculture. Problem is, there's not enough seed that is bred for organic agriculture, so it's a really important movement. These crop varieties are especially adapted to the challenges of organic systems, can better access organic fertility sources, compete with weeds, and resist pests. There seems to be a perfect storm happening right now in Oregon, the West Coast, and other parts of the country. I don't know if storm is really the right way to say it. It's a convergence of, of a movement, I think. It may be partly because of the need to breed new vegetable varieties, specifically for organic growing. It may be that growers are looking for new varieties to substitute the standards that through consolidation of seed companies that Monsanto now owns, that they don't want to grow anymore. That's what happened to us. We dropped in our wholesale nursery in Oregon in 2011. Every single variety that Monsanto would indirectly get money from. Uh, Pito is a really great seed company, but it was, I should say, a great seed company. It was bought by Seminus and then Monsanto bought Seminus. So uh, Pito had wonderful varieties that we love to grow for uh, uh, retail nurseries in Oregon and Washington. For instance, uh, Celebrity Tomato, Mariachi Pepper, Gypsy Pepper, Pac-Man Broccoli. But you, we don't want to give them any money anymore, so we were looking for other 
uh, varieties to take the place of these, and that's how we came across these incredible breeders doing things and got involved with this sponsorship and actually started a seed company on the side. So, it may be because of the trend to focus on phytonutrient content that there's a real uh, change in uh, what is available, what breeders are doing. It, but it all adds up to huge strides happening right now in creative vegetable breeding. Part of the reason is this now national movement, another movement besides breeding vegetables, that is focusing on taste and utility of vegetables. We've always been into flavor, but this is a new emphasis. It may have started with Dan Barber, the chef at Blue Hill at Stone Barns in New York. Dan was named one of the world's most influential people by Time Magazine in 2009. He's done much to raise the bar. The way I heard one story, Dan found out there were 80 chefs coming to the UN to have a meeting in, at the, at, in New York. Somehow he convinced the chefs, to, the, uh, the chiefs, I'm sorry, he heard that 80 chiefs of state were coming for a meeting, and somehow he convinced the chiefs of state to all bring their chefs. So then he had a meeting at uh, his restaurant out on a farm outside Manhattan about 45 minutes, and he invited 25 vegetable, vegetable breeders to meet with these chefs. And the vegetable breeders brought their newest uh, varieties to the dinner, and they talked about what they'd like to see in vegetables. And the meetings have continued ever since. And it, you know, you can see all over the country how there's been, uh, this is jumpstart, this uh, movement to really inspect what we expect from vegetables and how we can improve vegetables through breeding. Uh, the, the chefs and the uh, breeders who knew that the, the breeder, how would the breeders know, for instance, that the chefs would prefer that acorn squash, if it was round, was not rogued out? You know, because acorn squash usually has ridges. Uh, the, the chefs had extra labor that they had to put into working with the ridges. Or how about peppers, the sunken stems of peppers, uh, instead of rounded shoulders on peppers, made extra work for the chefs. So. All this set uh, uh, in motion new characteristics people were looking for and breeding for in vegetables since 2009 especially. Today, more than 100 Northwest breeders, farmers, chefs, and seed growers are collaborating on more flavorful vegetable varieties, some with extra vitamins and phytonutrients, and they have started a network called the Culinary Breeding Network and also received a grant, there's about five universities involved, to really look at vegetables for flavor, taste, and ex experiment with new vegetables by farming out into using a mother-daughter uh, trial uh, uh, strategy of having farms that grow a lot of the same things as a mother, a lot of the a variety, a lot of plants in the same variety as a mother, and then satellite farms that are growing the same variety so that they compare, compare notes. And then they meet together to uh, work to decide what to what to pursue. Uh, and the Novik grant was a started by, uh, Jim, is the director of the Novik grant is Jim Myers, who was the first one to bring out indigo tomatoes. The phytonutrients in indigo tomatoes um, make them four times better for you than uh, regular tomatoes. Uh, what happened was Jim Myers and his graduate students uh, found the, some old germ plasma uh, plasm that was uh, stored at University of California in Davis and used that uh, to breed with tomatoes to unlock or unsilence a gene that all tomatoes have, which is a gene that makes more anthocyanins uh, uh, in tomatoes. And that is what the purple uh, reflects, that they actually uh, contain more anthocyanins. Um, uh, a lot sprung from that. Brad Gates has indigo tomatoes. Tom Wagner has indigo tomatoes. Um, I actually had this wonderful video to show you uh, of the Culinary Breeding Network's uh, event last September 28th. There's another one this September, uh, but unfortunately it didn't 
uh, come through on my PowerPoint, but this is my uh, table at this event last September, uh, and I'm, I'm sharing uh, these various tomatoes that we're sponsoring from different breeders. There was a whole room of breeders and chefs that had made things like sorbet out of a mild habanero pepper from uh, the Cornell uh, Mike Musiak breeder, or you know had like 15 kinds of cilantro that we were all testing, um, and you know uh, carrots and potatoes, and it's it's really uh, been very exciting to be involved with this uh, culinary breeding network. And if you go to the slide uh, uh, paper that I sent. I passed out. On the back, there is uh, the growing, cooking up a story. That's where you can look at the video I was going to show you, and they have some other wonderful videos also there. Creative New Oregon and Washington Seed Companies are sourcing improved varieties directly from far truck farmers them who improve their seed crops every year by painstaking reselecting for better traits and for quality, for tastiness, for performance, and disease resistance. Through their attention to detail, oops, I'm on the indigo tomatoes still. This is the cooking up the story that I told you to check out later. Sorry. This is the goals of the culinary breeding network I was going to show you. See, they identify the varieties and the breeding lines of superior flavor, texture, culinary attributes, neutral value, uh, and uh, try to have more access to these organic seed varieties as a collaboration between plant breeders, seed growers, farmers, chefs, wholesalers, retailers, and, and international breeders. And this is what we're doing at the end of this month, this time, uh, with the Culinary Breeding Network. Each one of these farms on the left have breeding projects on the right that we'll be testing. This is a, a variety of Italian broccoli that's, a, uh, that's one of the plants that they're testing all together through this mother-daughter trial farm this season through the Novak grant. And uh, you can see from the... Uh, uh, slideshow what the name of that is and uh, uh, you might want to Google that sometime because it's very very exciting new variety. Let's see if I can find my slide. It's the, a leaf broccoli called Spirgoella lysia and uh, every part of the plant is edible and it, it doesn't really create a head. It makes these wonderful gray leaves that are tender through the season. And this is another crop that uh, this Novak grant and these breeders and farmers are working on. This is a, a leaf celery. Uh, there's about 30 kinds of heirloom leaf celeries that don't make the, you know, that you don't blanch, that you don't take the stalks of, that you actually take the whole plant. And it has a, a lot of benefit and it. it's one of those, you know, undiscovered heirloom uh, categories. So this, this is a pomegranate crunch. This is a lettuce from uh, Frank Morton in Philomath. And uh, so what I was going to say is that people like Frank Morton and other truck farmers uh, actually themselves are breeders. And a lot of these new seed companies are tapping into this expertise of the truck farmer instead of just looking for uh, content, you know, like uh, commercial breeders. Uh, and the truck farmer uh, looks for uh, uh, success. And uh, oftentimes, uh, I've got friends that complain about the purity of seed because a lot of the seed companies don't constantly back cross and uh, try to keep heirloom seed pure and straight the way it really originally was. You can't just like gather this year's seed crop from, uh, uh, from you know, just from last year's seed. You have to constantly be roguing and keeping the, the crops uh, straight. And so uh, one friend that's, uh, for instance, uh, 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 doing this, uh, was working on these tomatoes, uh, looking for better traits. Another friend, uh, actually Fred Hampel, came up with these bumblebee tomatoes uh, as a farmer that was working. He's more of a breeder than a farmer, but uh, my point is that there's some cool stuff out there. And uh, this, for instance, is two types of celery uh, cross. It's a, a green celery a cross with the giant red celery to make red venture celery. And uh, this is really nice swizzle sticks if you like to have a swizzle stick in your drink. <laughs> um, 
So superior varieties, here's a, a, a wonderful variety. Um, uh, superior varieties are being created by farmers too. And they're just now getting into the seed industry because people are getting smart. Uh, this one is the Bumblebees and Tigers by Fred Hempel, for instance. So, pure food, that's what we're all here for. We're reveling in pure food. And this event is always an inspiration to people in the seed business uh, uh, to, to inspire them to continue to strive to find these incredible new varieties for pertinent and popular and successful and delicious crops. Uh, careful trialing is really cr critical both for new varieties and for uh, keeping old heirlooms strong. The fastest growing segment of the U.S. of U.S. gardeners right now uh, that these seed companies are watching um, and uh, uh, trying to uh, support are men, and uh, that are male millennials uh, between 18 and 35. Uh, it's actually 18% uh, growth in that category. And so that, that DIY generation uh, is gardening for utility. Uh, you know, why garden unless you're going to use something? And so uh, what we do is we trial new varieties and uh, we learn their utility and we try to find the superstars and discover the nuances all based on direct experiential comparisons. And then we seek to help breeders know what people are looking for to create new breeding genetics. But this is the same hunger that really motivates uh, the home gardener. Uh, the same hunger that the breeder and the chef and the grower uh, uh, is motivated to pursue their bliss, so to speak. Um, because uh, it, it's just a wonderful time to be in gardening because people are really experimenting. And we, we know this because at Log House Plants, my wholesale nursery in Oregon, uh, we've been spending, we've been for the last 40 years, had the most fun uh, following our bliss, finding creative projects and uh, making them real and accessible to home gardeners, categories, uh, various labeling systems um, uh, to help home gardeners have a reason to support the nurseries we sell to, which are all independent uh, nurseries, independent, independent retail nurseries. So they don't just go to chain stores, they keep these nurseries and the very texture and fabric of our society uh, alive. And so we've been able to do project after project, uh, a parade of projects. Um, in fact, um, uh, grafting, for instance, we've, uh, when we started grafting vegetables six years ago, uh, you know, we encourage people to trial grafted. So you have on the left, you have the non-grafted tomato, big beef, on the right, that's grafted. That's a difference in putting roots that are Every tomato we eat is the same species. In the whole world, it's all the same species. But there are other tomatoes worldwide that have better qualities that our tomato we eat don't have, like disease resistance and power, hardiness, ability to uh, 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 live in salty environments, ability to make roots that are uh, uh, 8 to 10 feet wide, so they're actually water-wise. And so uh, our nursery tries to get, and it's not hard because everybody loves to do this, people to compare. Like on the right is the not grafted tomato planted the same day it was the same size as on the one on the left. These are grown on single ropes. This is sweetheart. So the difference with these new roots on the left uh, are, you know, 36 inch long ray seams versus the 18 of the not grafted on the right. On the, on the left is the non-grafted indigo. This is the most ornamental and healthful tomato in the world that Jim Myers created. It is late though, it's 90 days, so we have new versions of this that are uh, shorter, like uh, indigo cherry drops is 70 days. But indigo rose uh, is, uh, on the, is, makes more fruit when it's grafted, just like any tomato. Uh, per acre we get 42 uh, tons of uh, fruit from indigo rose uh, not grafted. If it's grafted, we get 147 tons. It was measured at Oregon State University, so grafting really makes a difference. 
if we're sh if we're showing kale at our retail nurseries in Oregon and Washington, we grow 30 kinds of kale. We we help uh, gardeners know what better varieties are, how to make them different. This is the new black magic hybrid uh, dwarf growing dinosaur kale. It's a wonderful new uh, 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 hardy kale. And uh, this is the only kale that I know of that is uh, that will not go to seed. It's called cosmic kale. And the only way we can propagate it is from making cuttings. Uh, actually, a, a breeder gave it to me in 2000 in Holland, and he had created it by doing root divisions. But it's the most statuesque kale that just grows beautifully and branched, and it stays tender. I have one that's lived for six years in our garden, and we went to minus six uh, two Christmases ago. We tell people uh, uh, to look out for like 30 varieties of garlic and how each one makes them different. So we know that our clientele, our customers at the nurseries that we sell to are doing the same things as what we're doing with trialing new varieties. There's a thirst for knowing what thing, how things work. We all feel it. It's the joy of gardening. It's experimenting. It's science projects. Here's a really cool plant. This one, uh, through our good karma of marketing our Mighty Mato grafted vegetables, the breeder gave us the exclusive in North America on this world's first grape. So we sold 40,000 of them last season. This grape, through our, my partnership with a big grower in Southern California called Plug Connection, this grape uh, was discovered by a researcher in Cornell 11 years ago, and it does not, uh, uh, it just is not utilize gibberellic acid. It has a mutated gene. It was naturally occurring, so gibberellic acid is a hormone, so it stays short. It's totally awesome grape. It, at full uh, height, at 10 years old, it will be 24 inches long, uh, tall. And uh, you can see how beautiful it is. We have two Pinots and a, a Riesling and a Chardonnay. And they're just starting to get out in the market. And then we also uh, grafted Ketchman fries. Uh, you may have heard of this. It's a tomato grafted on a potato. And you actually get two crops. What you do is you harvest the tomatoes all season. Uh, and then at the end of the season, you cut off the, uh, the bush. And just like a daffodil dying back to put start in the root, starch in the roots, the tomato has finished sending messages to the potato. And so the potato knows, to, because you cut it off, so the potato knows to uh, start seasoning and, seasoning and making sweeter the potatoes. So we've had a lot of fun selling this this season in, or in the U.S. through to wholesale growers who finish it then for uh, retail outlets. Um, and uh, it was even on the Colbert Report, in fact. This is my partner who owns Plug Connection meeting me at a show. He got ants in his pants and he dug up his ketchup and fries in July and brought it. He had cut off the uh, tomato and washed the potatoes. So there's just so much to explore and there's so much uh, that's not been discovered yet in vegetables. So let's just quickly go through a few things. I mentioned that truck farmers have a hard time sometimes getting pure seed because the seed companies sometimes have a uh, bottom line mentality of not putting their efforts into back crossing and keeping the seeds strong. That's true with these khaki pumpkins. Actually, uh, Cliff Bars have put some, a lot of money into researching the best hullus uh, pump, uh, seed. The beauty of hullus pumpkin seeds, and that's what comes from the khaki pumpkin, uh, is that you can eat the whole seed. So, of course, Cliff Bars would like to be able to use them, and that's why their research, they're up sponsoring it. But they sponsor tons of really great things. It's a great business. This is a, a purple a broccoli. Maybe you've heard of purple sprouting broccoli. That's the most famous uh, purple broccoli. But the uh, uh, breeders have made one that will grow purple broccoli now, even in spring and the summer. And this one is called Summer Promise. Red ball Brussels sprouts. This is an old heirloom variety. The beauty of that is that what well, gets darker red when it's colder, but aphids are not attracted to red ball uh, uh, Brussels sprouts. So if you have a problem with Brussels sprouts and aphids, go for that. People are noticing this uh, uh, old uh, variety of strawberry. It's a different species than regular fragarias. Uh, it's called pineberry. And so there's, it's starting to be in the market now. 
you know, it, there's so much to discover. Uh, this one, uh, they say it's an Iceland berry. Uh, that makes sense with the color. It has a slight uh, flavor of pineapple, so they call it the pine berry. It's a June bearing uh, strawberry. Of course, there's a lot of cool, like, wow plants, like that strawberry. This is another wow plant. You see it, and you go, you know, this is a corn. That's a tricolor corn. Uh, and it grows small corns that are good for popcorn. It's called Z maize japonica. And it's really nice in a mixed container as a focal plant. And uh, Bear, uh, Baker Creek has uh, this in their catalog. I brought it back from India, too, in 2000. Uh, it's a, a cucumber that looks like a potato. Uh, in, the, in India and in Russia especially, they use cucumbers differently than we do here. They, they store cucumbers. This is really a storing cucumber. Is it remains crisp for the longest time. An old variety that people haven't seen. Uh, this is a pretzel bean. Uh, so, you know, you steam it and uh, it's a cow pea, uh, and you can just stick it in your uh, fish as a garnish, and that's kind of fun. Uh, this is at uh, Kiwa. Uh, the breeder has all kinds of varieties now, state, straight Kiwa. Uh, and your slide list shows some of those. Uh, if you Google any of those, you'll go to their uh, seed company to order direct. And uh, the, that seed company, Frank Morton, has done all kinds of uh, world famous uh, different lettuce varieties and chicories. But years ago, he sent me a variety, and I wanted a picture, and he didn't, it was before digital times, and it was called, uh, it was Cross. Two families cross is a, a really happening a lot. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's not uh, G-E-O, uh, it's G-M-O, which we've all been doing for 12,000 years since the hunting and gathering times, modifying our uh, varieties by eating more of uh, sweet varieties and less of bitter varieties. Uh, so, you know, when you cross families, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not a scary thing. And this uh, breeder crossed chicory and endive, and he called this spickled fritz chicken dive. But he didn't give me a picture, so we put a little chicken diving in for a joke. Here's a, a pepper that was uh, done by a farmer in a gathering together farm, uh, Jolene's Red uh, Italian, great variety. And that's one that doesn't have that sunken stem. And gathering's gold. Uh, ghost peppers that they say are a million off the Schofield, rumored to be the hottest pepper, but there are some hotter ones. Porcelain doll pumpkins, cool, with orange flesh. Whoops, there's the ghost pepper, sorry. This is what you could do with peppers. Every pepper, when you dry them uh, and powder them dried, will be a different color of dried pepper. So it's so fun to make jars of different pepper dried to use, powdered. Just buy yourself a cheap coffee grinder for 10 bucks at a hardware store and keep that just for grinding your peppers. Here's the ghost pepper. Here's the pink porcelain doll, orange fresh. That was for the cancer um, uh, support. Here's a sunken stem tomato. That also adds more labor and waste. And so the breeders are looking for more heart-shaped tomatoes now because it, it's much easier for, there's a, actually this is Brad Gates' uh, Berkeley tie-dye heart grafted. This is a new breeder we're working with. This is called a dragon's tongue. This isn't out yet. It's a very meaty uh, ox heart. Basil, we're working with breeders that are working for seed varieties that are uh, 22 weeks to bloom instead of 10 weeks. Oh, you've got to try this. This is wasabi arugula. The flowers and the leaves taste exactly like wasabi. So, you know, the breeders are playing around. So cauliflower, this is not an heirloom variety. This is a stick cauliflower. It's not a hybrid, though. So you could gather seed, but stick cauliflower instead of the round crown. And uh, here's broccoli crossed with kale. It's called peacock. First you have the broccoli, the kale, then you have the broccoli. This is kind of like stick cauliflower. It's been a, a galeon, which is Chinese broccoli, and broccoli cross. And they're even crossing heirlooms. This is Brandywine and Costaluda Genovese cross. So you have the hybrid vigor with the heirloom taste. And Delicata cross with how much time? Zero? <laughs> oh, God. Delicata. Here's one. Squashkin is a squash cross with a pumpkin. So the, 
We'll stop with this, but you've got to see this because you may be seeing the produce markets now. This is a Brussels sprout cross with kale. It's one of the most statuous plants. And instead of that hard Brussels sprout at each node, you have a rosette. And they're just beautiful. They come towards you. They stay in the garden. At this point, there's uh, about three varieties. And they're not at all like this anymore. They're rosettes called kaleettes in our garden at home. So thank you very much.